Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and in our continuing survey of the Old Testament, we come now to our study of the Gospel of John. First of all, we ought to contrast the synoptic Gospels, that is, the Gospels Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with that of John. We described the, the word synoptic, mean, meaning uh, that it, you see the same things uh, in those three Gospel accounts as opposed to John. In the synoptics, there's an emphasis there on the kingdom inheritance. Now, the kingdom is mentioned in, in the Gospel of John, but really the emphasis here in John is the eternal life inheritance. In the Synoptic Gospels, we have a description of the various historical events that, that take place. John does that too, but in John there's more reflection on the meaning of those events. So we have in the Gospel of John, I, I think, quite a bit more commentary on the things that Jesus says and does. In the Synoptic Gospels, we very often read the short sayings of Jesus. Now, uh, remember we talked about in Matthew as actually organized around five sermons in the central part. But in spite of that, we, we still have many of the short sayings of Jesus, whereas in John, the tendency is to look at the longer discourses of Jesus. In the Synoptic Gospels, we have an emphasis on future prophecy, not so much on John's account. John has relatively little on future prophecy. John begins, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word. And of course, as soon as you hear those words, you're, you're taken back to Genesis chapter 1 that starts off, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, here, in the beginning was the word. In fact, we could actually render that, uh, it's a Greek imperfect, we could actually render that, in the beginning already was the word. And the word already was with God. And the word already was God. And he already was in the beginning with God. That is, this isn't talking about the word coming into it, into existence. He already was. He was there in the beginning. The word was. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, as we hear that, we can listen to that in two different ways. We can listen to it from a Greek point of view. And, and those of us from the Western world maybe have a, a tendency to, to read that and think of Plato and and how he talked about the logos and you know that that great principle uh, and certainly I think John's Greek readers might have done that um, and and seen that idea borrowed from Greek philosophy and and applied to what we're going to see and eventually uh, Jesus but if you're a Hebrew reader then you're going to see a different emphasis. So I can imagine, you know, John's Greek reader saying, hey, look at that. That sort of reminds me of, of you know, Gr Greek uh, philosophical ideas and it's applying it to Jesus. Isn't that great? Whereas his Hebrew readers might have had a very different approach and said, no, isn't that wonderful? It's taking me back to Genesis where God spoke things into existence and here's the one that's speaking things into existence and that's Jesus. And they both would have been right. Verse 3 tells us that all things came into being through him. And apart from, and the him, is the, the subject of our uh, topic has been uh, this one called the word, the logos, the word. Verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So it's not like he created part of it or he created a little bit of it. But we're told here that, that anything that exists, he created it all. That all things came into being through him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's interesting, this correlation between life and light. And, and the focus here, is, it begins with life, but then it, it takes us to light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So we have this picture, again, this takes me back to Genesis, because on, on day one, in fact, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, God said, let there be... Notice he's speaking it. Let there be light, and there was light. And here, the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not, our translation here says comprehend it. Uh, the Greek text, you know, uh, literally, the, the darkness did not take it. Or, or let me describe that. The, the, the darkness did not get it. Let me put it th that way. Um, and when I say the darkness did not get it, you can take that one of two ways. You can take say the darkness was trying to understand it. That's how it's translated here. Comprehend it. I, like when you, you're studying, you say, oh, I get it. Or you can take the same phrase and say the darkness tried to get it. The, it tried to pull it down. It tried to attack it. it you know, like get him. And he tried to get him. And in the Greek text, the, you, you can actually translate it either way. It has 
can have either one of those meanings, maybe, maybe both at the same time. We get down to verse 14 and we have the word identified where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, the word is describing the one whom we know as Jesus, who became flesh and he, he dwelt, he lived among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Remember the transfiguration event that is described in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not described in John, but John here tells us that he knows about it because John says, we knew his glory. We beheld, we saw his glory. It was the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, after we get out of that prologue of the first 18 verses, we then move into the historical narrative section of the whole central section of the Gospel of John, and it's going to be involved in the first chapter with uh, different people meeting Jesus. Although first we have not an encounter with Jesus, but we have John the Baptist who is giving testimony about his past encounters with Jesus. And he's telling the story almost by way of a flashback. You know, It's not really a flashback in the sense that suddenly you go back, but you're hearing John talk about a previous uh, encounter that he had had with Jesus. And then the next day, John is talking to some of his disciples. Uh, a Andrew is one of those. And then a, he's, he's another one just called the other disciple, unnamed. And they are hearing John uh, speak. And John sees Jesus. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and this other disciple, he's not mentioned, he's, he's not named. That's going to happen a few times makes you wonder if it's always the same disciple because John's going to talk uh, uh, a bit later about, about a disciple Jesus loved and he won't mention his name and it becomes evident when we compare the writings of John with Matthew Mark and Luke that that other disciple is actually John himself not John the Baptist John the Apostle and so maybe that was the other person here we're not told so we can't make that assumption but Andrew and this other disciple they see Jesus and they begin to follow him and Jesus turns around and says what are you looking for and they said uh, uh, I think they you know sort of put them on the spot and so they say well where are you staying and he says well come on and see and they go with him and then not only do they see they spend the day with Jesus and so you have this this you know this journey beginning of people meeting Jesus. We get to the next section, still in chapter 1. Andrew goes and gets his brother. His brother's name is Simon. Now, we know him as Simon Peter, but Jesus meets Simon and says, I'm going to call you by a nickname. I'm going to call you Peter. Actually, it means rock. So, I'm going to call you Simon Rocky, uh, Simon Peter. Uh, and we're told more significance about that later on. It's going to come up uh, later on in in Matthew but here John mentions it right here in John chapter 1 and so Peter becomes one of the disciples of John next we have Philip uh, and Philip is um, he he meets Jesus and he becomes so excited he goes to a friend of his named Nathaniel and he says uh, we've we've met you know the Messiah and uh, Nathaniel says, oh, really, where is he from? And, and Philip says, well, he's, he's Jesus of Nazareth. N Nazareth? Um, can anything really good come out of Nazareth? It's like saying he's from Las Vegas. You say, can anything good come from Las Vegas? You know, and not that Nazareth had that kind of bad reputation, but it was a little nothing place. Um, can anything come, you know, you know b messiahs need to come from big places, you know, good places. You know, like maybe, maybe Denver, Colorado would be a good place. I don't know, I'm, you know get in trouble with folks that are listening by mentioning cities. But but Nathaniel comes and meets Jesus. Yeah, and that, actually, that's what Philip says. Philip says, well, come and see for yourself. And, and so Nathaniel does. And Jesus looks at him and says, oh, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, in whom there is no dishonesty. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a loose play on words. You have to pick up on this because when he calls him an Israelite, remember, Israelites are all sons of Jacob. And the name Jacob actually means cheater, you know, cheat, somebody who, who pulls one over on you. And so, in a sense, Jesus is, is saying, uh, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no Jacob. And, uh, and, and Nathaniel seems sharp enough to have picked up on that. And he says, Well, how do you know me? And Jesus says to him, I saw you under the fig tree. 
Now, I have no idea what happened under the fig tree. You have no idea what happened under the fig tree. Nobody has any idea what happened under, under the fig tree except Nathaniel and Jesus. And that was enough for Nathaniel to say, Oh, well, you are the Son of God. And Jesus says, basically, you know, you're, you're just a little too easily convinced, but guess what? You're going to see some things that will really, imp you, th you was impressed by that? You're going to get some, see some things that were, are really going to impress you. You will see angels ascending and descending. And as soon as you say that phrase, you say, I, wait a minute, I remember that story. Angels ascending and descending, that's actually a line from Genesis chapter 28 when Jacob is on the run and, and heading to Haran out on his adventures and he has a dream and a vision of a ladder ascending to heaven with angels ascending and descending on the ladder. But Jesus says, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. On him. He's the ladder. He's the, the approach to God. And so it's a wonderful series of encounters that we see in chapter 1, people meeting Jesus. Now once we come to John chapter 2, from there to, all, to chapter 11, and that's the whole first section of the book, we're introduced to seven signs, um, seven miracles. The first of those, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, is where Jesus turns water into wine. Notice that there is a correlation uh, the first and the last, the, the first miracle there, he turns water into wine. The last miracle, he is the raising of Lazarus. So we have um, the first one taking place at a wedding, the last one taking place at a funeral. One uh, brings forth in, in a spirit of celebration. The other one takes place at a time of mourning. Uh, of course, by the end of the day, there's a celebration at both places. The second miracle, John ch uh, chapter 4, verses 46 through 54, we have the healing of the nobleman's son. That corresponds, notice, to John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. There is a blind man who is also healed. His blindness is overturned, and now he sees. Now you say, what's the correlation beyond the fact that, that there's a healing that takes place? Notice that in both cases, it is a long-distance healing. In John chapter 4, verses 44, 46 through 54, um, the nobleman is from a different town. He comes to uh, to Jesus where he's at, and he's from from Cana, but he comes to see Jesus. And Jesus says, "Go on home. Your son has been healed." And it's a, a long walk back home. It, you know, something like 18 miles or so. Um, and so the man goes back home, just like according to the words of Jesus. He gets back the next day, and he finds out not only is his son better, but he started to get better at the very time that Jesus had spoken to him. So it was a long-distance healing. Likewise, in John chapter 9, where there's a blind man, and Jesus is going to heal him, but what Jesus does is tell him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And they're not by the pool of Siloam. They're in another place, but that he goes down to the Pool of Siloam for a blind man to, to make any kind of journey like this. This is, you know, yes, it, yes, in the same city. It's down to the other end of the city. But for a blind man to, to make his way down there, that's not an easy task. As, but the man travels down to the Pool of Siloam. He washes in the Pool of Siloam just like he was told to do. And then he sees. So in both cases, there is a long distance uh, uh, miracle that takes place. In John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18, we have the healing of the lame man. He is at the pool. That corresponds to John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. Here is Jesus walking on the water. So this isn't a healing and a healing. This is a healing and then a miraculous uh, sign where he's walking on water. But notice in both cases, they involve water. Um, one man is healed at the pool. The other is walking on not just the pool, but uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and, and still in a storm uh, as well. Uh, but both take place in and around water. And then the central one, uh, the feeding of the 5,000, that's given in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And of course, at that time, that's going to give an impetus to the words of Jesus, where he says, not only do I give bread, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. You must partake of me if you want to live. Now, we're meant to see these signs through the eyes of the disciples. They're, they are seeing it for the first time. We are experiencing it with them. And as we read of their reaction, they are said to be growing in their belief. And as they see the signs, uh, they're growing in their belief. And as we see the signs, we are meant to grow with them.
all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, begin with a statement of the true identity of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, here it is, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's you know the opening statement that tells us who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Mark starts off, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Right from verse 1, uh, we're told who he is. In Luke's account, it doesn't take place on the first verse. It takes place a bit later um, as, as Mary is being Excuse me, Mary is being told about the birth of Jesus, and the angel comes and says, The holy child shall be called the Son of God. So it takes place in the narrative, that's a little bit different, but still in the first chapter. And then John chapter 1, verse 1, we already saw this, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have an early statement as to the true identity of Jesus in all four gospel accounts. Now, let's look at some of the titles that are used of Jesus. First of all, he is called, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, the Son of Man. That is the title that he uses most often of himself. And you say, well, aren't we all sons of men in a sense? Yes, but this calls to mind a particular verse over in Daniel chapter 2. Um, this is used most often by Jesus. Daniel chapter, I'm um, not ch chapter 2, chapter 7, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 th and 14 give the background of this title where um, the one who is like the Son of Man uh, comes before the Ancient of Days, and you get the, em emphasis, uh, the emphasis of who he really is. Uh, modern Reform scholars look at that title, the Son of Man, and they see, wow, based upon Daniel chapter 7, that's emphasizing his deity. The early church fathers looked at that same title. They saw it as an emphasis on the humanity of Jesus. I want to suggest that it's both. It brings both the divine aspect and the human aspect of Jesus, uh, the, the two natures, we would say, uh, theologically speaking, of Jesus together into the one person that he is. So we have the Son of Man. He's also called Messiah or Christ. Now Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek. Uh, two different languages to say the same thing. And in both cases, whether you're saying it Messiah in Hebrew or Christ in Greek, you're saying the Anointed One because that's what the term means. Uh, so it means the one who has been anointed. It's rarely used by Jesus as a self-designation. The only time he does so in public, Mark chapter 14, verses 61 and 62, is where Jesus is on trial and he is asked point blank by the high priest, are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds in, in the affirmative. On the other hand, the Old Testament background. Now, the Old Testament doesn't use the term Messiah a lot to speak of the future coming Messiah. It can talk about the anointed one. Uh, for example, a king might be an, an, an anointed one, or a prophet might be an anointed one, or a priest could be one who was anointed. But it, there are a, a, a few instances where the prophets talked about a future anointed one, and of course, when you heard that, you would automatically think, well, is that, does that mean the anointed one, the future anointed one, is going to be a prophet, or is he going to be a priest, or is he going to be a king? And our answer is all three, because Jesus is all three, as in his messiahship, in his anointing, he is both prophet and priest and king. So priests were anointed, prophets were anointed, kings were anointed, and Jesus was all three of these. Another title for Jesus that we see, and especially in John, although we just saw it's not limited to John, the Son of God. He is called the Son of God. Jesus applied it to himself fairly infrequently. Not many times does he re refer to himself by such a term. He uses the term Father generally when he wants to speak of God, you know, God the Father. And he only accepted the title of God, really, on one occasion. And that is in John chapter 20, verse uh, 28, when Thomas sees the risen Lord, and Thomas falls down before him, and Thomas says to him, My Lord and my God, and he's not taking the name, you know, he's not taking God's name in vain. He's, he's actually addressing Jesus as my God. 
And Jesus does not correct him. In fact, Jesus praises and speaks and compliments and speaks highly of his faith. Lord. That's another term that's used. Now, the term Lord, the Greek word there in the New Testament is kurios, it can be used as a title of respect. We would say Mr. Or if you're familiar with Spanish, you say Señor. But like Spanish, when you say Señor, you could be speaking Mr. Just get a title of respect. Or you could be speaking of the Señor, the Lord, and it's used also of God. So it's used in the Septuagint, just like it, I told you it was in Spanish. Uh, it was used in that early uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. When you see the letters LXX, that's a shorthand for Septuagint. Uh, it was used in the Septuagint when they wanted to translate the Tetragrammaton, that is the, the name of God, Yahweh, we think it's pronounced, although we're not entirely sure. Uh, but when, when they wanted to, to translate that name into the Greek New Testament, they substituted the Greek word kurios, or Lord. In the Gospels, we, when we speak of the Father, um, he is called that, you know, the Abba, the Father, the, or Abba, if you want to just say it in regular uh, uh, Hebrew. And, um, or in the epistles, we refer, especially in Paul's epistles, when he wants to refer to the Father, he often refers to God, Theos. On the other hand, in the epistles, when Paul wants to speak of the second person of the Godhead, that is Jesus, he refers to him as curious as the Lord. Uh, whereas in the Gospels, you just have the terms Father and Son that are used to distinguish between the two, uh, the first two persons of the Godhead. The epistles tend to use Theos, that is God, and Curios, that is Lord, for, for those two terms. Now, there are titles for Jesus that are unique, fairly unique, I think, to John's Gospel account. John refers to Jesus in John chapter 1 as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and then we see in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, so that's evidently speaking of Jesus, but he's described as the Word, that is God's communication with us. Secondly, he's called the, and I'm translating it here, the only born. Um, for example, uh, we read about his only born son, and and scholars are a bit of a, a quandary on how to translate this. Um, similar not only to, to only born, monogenes, or also the firstborn. And I don't have that one up here. So let me back up for just a moment. The only born son, um, but also the firstborn. And Jesus is called that, not so much in John, but in some of the other uh, writings in the New Testament. For example, in the epistles, he's called the firstborn. Uh, there it's speaking more of the preeminent one. Uh, the firstborn was the, the one in, in ancient culture that got all the inheritance. So he's the preeminent one. But John refers to him as the only born. That doesn't mean that nobody else has ever been born. But he was the only born in that special sense. God's only born son uh, in that sense. He, G, John is, uh, also calls Jesus the light of the world. Um, the one who brings light. Light allows you to see and and it's Jesus that allows us to see everything in its most clear form. Uh, John also refers to Jesus as the resurrection and the life. In fact, he has these words coming from the mouth of Jesus, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection, I am the life. Um, and then later on he says, uh, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Uh, in John chapter 8, verse 58, there's a striking place where, where Jesus says, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And it's not I am something, just I am. And that is particularly striking because that's a more or less a word-for-word -word, uh, repetition of what we see in the Greek Septuagint back in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse, verses 14 and 15, when Moses says, you know, she really shouldn't be sending me to Egypt to represent you, God, because I don't even know your name. And, and God says, here's my name, I am that I am. And Jesus stands there and says, before Abraham was, I am. And they get it. They, they put it together. They're ready to stone him uh, over that. And they recognize exactly what it is he is claiming. 
he describes himself as the good shepherd. Now, again, we hear that and we think, oh, isn't that nice? But you have to remember that somebody living in that day where they were so familiar with the Old Testament, they would remember the Old Testament passage, for example, Psalm 23, where God says, uh, the Lord, is, or uh, not the Lord says, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And Jesus is claiming that title for himself. He is claiming to be the good shepherd that, that watches over the sheep. Jesus says, I am the door. It's an analogy describing, uh, again, using shepherd language, where the shepherd would often uh, come and sort of place himself at the entry to the sheepfold so that none of the sheep would escape. It actually have to go through him. And Jesus is saying by that, you have to go, you want to come into the kingdom, you have to go through me. Uh, I am the entry to the kingdom. Now we already mentioned that John chapter 1 verses, or actually chapters 2 through 11, have those signs. That entire section is given over to describing the public ministry of Jesus. When we get to John chapter 12, now we have the private ministry, and that takes us through the end of the book. So the, the first half of the book, chapters 1 through 11, take place over a period of a, around three years, maybe a little bit longer, you know, but at least it seems to be a, at least about three years long. The reason we know that is because there's a number of Passovers as well as other feasts that are mentioned. So whenever a Passover takes place, uh, that's obvious that another year has gone by. Uh, and so we can count them up as well as in, insert some of the other feasts that are mentioned. And we can see that at least about three years, now honestly maybe it was longer, maybe, maybe the ministry of Jesus could have been four or five, six years but a, a, at least a period of three years. And then we get to the private ministry section, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, and now we're dealing with the last week in the life of Jesus before his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, and then, of course, the resurrection, that's going to be in John chapter 20. So your first section, chapters 1 through 11, your location is all throughout Israel. First, Jesus is in, in Ju Judea, then he's in, in Samaria, then he's in Galilee, then he's back in Judea, in Jerusalem, sort of back and forth all throughout Israel. When we get to chapter 12, the action's all, all going to take place here in the city of Jerusalem. In chapters 1 through 11, we could be reminded of the words at the end of this book that says these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We're seeing that in chapters 1 through 11. And then in chapter 12, and that believing you might have life in his name. And chapters 12 through the end of the book are really going to talk more about the life that we have in Christ now that we've come to believe in him. Contrast between this, the synoptics versus the kingdom, uh, I'm sorry, the synoptics versus the Gospel of John. We've already noted the synoptics emphasize the kingdom. John emphasizes life, and yet these come together in John chapter 3, verse 3, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, that's talking about life in context, but it's using kingdom language. So they're really talking about the same thing even though there's an, a different emphasis in the use of terms. John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, this has become a problem, passage to many people. They wonder what on earth is that talking about. Notice, is born of water and the Spirit. Now, the Spirit part is easy. We know about the new birth, and, and that's being born of the Spirit. But Jesus is saying, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. And one must be born not just of spirit, but also of water. Uh, to what does this water refer? We go on to the next verse, and maybe this helps us a little bit. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now notice this, the spiritual part that's emphasized, and John uses, actually Jesus uses, the wind as an illustration, and that's a great illustration because the the Greek word, and it works in Hebrew too, but the Greek word for wind is the same as the Greek word for Spirit. You say pneuma, and you might be referring to wind, you might be referring to the Spirit. You have to look at the context to see which one you're describing. We get to John chapter 3 and verse 16. Famous verse, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the gospel, sort of in a nutshell. Notice it tells us not only that God loved the world, and he did, but God so loved the world, to the here's the measure to which he loved the world, he loved the world so much that he gave. And he gave his most precious possession, his only begotten son. That is his preeminent son, the special son, not just any old, the one that was supreme, his only son, so that whoever will believe in him will not perish, will not die, but will have eternal life. The gospel is as simple as that. It is believing, trusting in the one that God sent to die in our place. Now, what does John mean when he speaks of belief? First of all, when we speak of belief, there is there is what we could call cognition. In other words, to believe something, you have to know about the thing that you're going to believe. You have to be aware of it. You know, you, you just can't be a, a, a belief without any kind of knowledge at all. So there is that cognitive knowledge. Secondly, you have to be convinced of it. Here is the believing part. You actually have to think, well, yes, that's true, or else you're not really believing it. Uh, I don't believe in Santa Claus. You know, I don't believe that he's really there. Uh, so there is not just cognition, not just knowing the facts about it, but there's convincing. But it's not limited to that. There is also confidence in that we have confidence, we trust in the one in whom we are believing. Uh, if you sit down in a chair, you're putting your faith in that chair to hold you up. You, you're resting in it. You're exercising your confidence in that chair. And finally, in belief, and especially the way John uses it, but I think perhaps the way all the scriptures use it, there's an idea of commitment, where you are committing yourself in that confidence and convic conviction and cognition, those things that you know about and of which you're convinced and in, of which you're confident, you're committing yourself to be on the side of Jesus. It's not like you're trusting in him and saying, Lord, I, I hate you, but I'm going to trust in you. And that, no, that's not belief. Belief involves a commitment. John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. This is just a, a few verses after the John 3, 16 passage that we saw. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. There's something within us that left to ourselves we prefer darkness. We prefer to hide. Sort of reminds me of, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. After they've sinned, the, uh, they hear the presence of God moving. What do they do? They run and they hide. If there was darkness, they would have been there. Because there's something about evil that hates the light, hates to be exposed. And the light does that. When we come to the light, we are exposed for who we really are. And if we are trusting in Christ, then the good news is that I don't have to worry about who I am. I can trust in who Jesus was and is on my behalf for me because I trust in him and he forgives my sins. Verse 21, But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So the believer is one who comes to the light and who trusts in him and as a result Things begin to happen in his life. In John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, this is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. It's in the context of, of water and thirst. Jesus answers her and says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That is, when Christ comes into your life, he not only saves you, but he puts that within you, which will continue to nourish you. Later on, we're going to uh, see that water described as the spirit that he gives and places inside you, uh, that he would eventually do that. In John chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set a seal. 
And therefore, they, they ask him, they say, well, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? If, if working the works of God is what saves you, what, it, what work do I have to do? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has set. So the, the work that we are called to do to bring us to Christ, to bring us to that place of salvation, is to believe in him, to trust in him, to commit ourselves to him, to believe in him. Now, why do people believe? Jesus actually speaks to this in John chapter 6, beginning of verse 36. He says, but I said to you that, that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. There's, there's certain ones that, that Jesus is, is addressing. They've, they've seen Jesus. They've seen miracles. They've seen evidence of who he is, but, but they didn't believe. And then he goes on to explain, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. So if God gives you or to Jesus, then you're going to come. You're going to believe. But that presupposes that God has given you to him. The one that the Father gives comes to me. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, and you say, well, hasn't he given everyone? Well, that all he has given me, I will lose nothing, but I'll raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Well, you say, uh, how do I know that he has given uh, me to, to Jesus? Well, behold the Son and believe in him and you will find that that indeed has taken place. Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. He goes on to say, verse, 30, uh, verse 43, Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to, the, to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Notice there, there are those who hadn't come. And not only that, they don't like the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, well, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. And it will be written in the prophets. They shall all be taught of God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. You guys haven't come. But everyone that God teaches, God works inside them. And God draws them. And they do come. Does that describe you? Well, go to the Lord and find out. We get down to the end of the chapter. And Jesus again talks about those who don't believe. He says, but there are some of you who do not believe. And then we have John's explanation of this. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. Now we're talking not just about um, you know, certain folks out there, but among the twelve, there was one who did not believe. Verse 65, and he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. And Jesus is saying that to explain why some don't believe. Ponder that. Think about that. Now, that brings us to the question of John's eschatology. By eschatology, that's a, just a big word meaning last things. Uh, and, and how does John view the last things, the future? Well, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, he says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Notice the word deeds isn't actually there. Those who did good, those who did evil. He's explained elsewhere what's good, what's evil. You know, good is trusting in him. Evil is turning away from him. Um, but he says, don't marvel at that. You know, there's coming a time when there's going to be a resurrection. Those who are in the tombs will hear his voice. They'll come forth. Uh, and there will be a resurrection, both of life and a resurrection of judgment. And so John describes the future in terms of resurrection of life and resurrection of judgment. He goes on to say, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, that I lose nothing but raise it up on. And here John uses the phrase, it's an Old Testament phrase. We see it a lot, a lot of times in the Old Testament. John uses it too. I'll raise him up on the last day. For this 
is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So John looks forward to uh, a, a day in the future, the last day, and if it's the last day, that means no more days after that, and on the last day, that's when the resurrection takes place. Both the resurrection to life and the resurrection to judgment. He says in John chapter 14, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. So John's eschatology includes the fact that Jesus is going away. This is after his time on earth. But then at some time in the future, he's going to come back. And he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And Jesus, you know, notice he's talking about the last day. I'm going to, I'll be there in the last day. And I'm going to come again. And, and the implications that we draw is he's, he's going to come again at the last day and there will be a time of resurrection and a time of judgment. And that's, that's John's eschatology. Now there is throughout the Gospel of John, I think I've alluded to it already, but let's, let's mention it again. There is a faith journey that as we read it, we are reading with those who see Jesus, who meet Jesus. For example, Philip says, we have found the Messiah uh, in John chapter 1, verse 41. In verse 43, he goes on to say, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Uh, we've seen him. You know, he's the one that, that was described in the Old Testament. Um, in chapter 2, verse 11, after the wedding of Feast of Cana, we read that his disciples believed in him. In John chapter 4, verse 29, the Samaritan woman, after speaking with Jesus for a time, she runs into town, she goes to the men, she says, Some come see a, a man who told me all things I have done. Is this not the this is not the Christ, is it? And she phrases it in such a way where maybe they're going to be saying, Well, I don't know, but come on, isn't it? it certainly, could, couldn't this be the Christ? Uh, in John chapter 4, verse 42, they do come, the rest of them, they come and, and, and meet Jesus. And then they say, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. John chapter 4, verse 53, where John heals the nobleman's son, and the father, uh, we read that the father knew that it was the hour in which Jesus had said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole house, uh, his whole household too. And so he believes, and the rest of his household, uh, they, they see these miracles, and they believe. In John chapter 6, verses 67 through 69, uh, Jesus says to the twelve, this is after he has said some very difficult things, and, and the, the crowd just gets up and leaves. And only the twelve are there, and Jesus said therefore to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? And Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. In John chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, uh, Jesus uh, hears about the man who was born blind. He's been healed, and Jesus heard that they'd put him out of the synagogue. And finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him. And now he, this man hadn't seen a lot. He'd only been had his eyesight for in an hour or two now. You've both seen him, and he's the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. In John chapter 16, uh, again we have uh, the words, uh, Now we know that you know all things and have no need for, and this representative of all the disciples, have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. And finally in John chapter 20, verse 8, uh, this is at the resurrection. You, Peter runs to the tomb, and, and then that other disciple, and I, I tend to think it's John, but that, that other disciple is unnamed here. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb entered, and then also, and he saw, and he believed. And so we have this faith journey where people are believing throughout, throughout. 
John chapter 20, verse 27, where Thomas, you know, Thomas wasn't there to see the, the risen Jesus, and he heard about the resurrection. He says, I, I don't believe it unless I see him and then touch him and put my fingers into his hands and feel the nail prints, I won't believe. And, and a week later, Jesus shows up and he said to Thomas, reach here, your fingers see my hands, reach here, your hand, put it in my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And that's the climactic aspect of the faith journey. Now we come to the very last part of the Gospel of John, and in the, the last chapter there's a story that takes place by the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is he's by the shore and the disciples have gone back to fishing, at least a few of them have, and, and then they see somebody by the, by the shore, and, and uh, they've been fishing all night, haven't caught anybody, and he says, cast your nets on the other side, and they do it, and lo and behold, it's full of fish, and, and they get it, this is Jesus. And, uh, and they get back to shore, and Peter takes a shortcut. He comes uh, swimming. Uh, y you would have thought maybe he could walk on water, but he didn't. Uh, but they get back on shore, and they're eating, and Jesus turns to Peter and says, Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And, and the these, we're not sure, might have referred to the disciples, but probably seems to refer to the fish. After all, Peter had been a fisherman, and, and Jesus is asking him, Make a decision. Uh, do you love me? And Jesus and Peter says, yeah, I love you. And, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then he asks him a second time, do you love me? And they go through it again. And then he asks him a third time. And Peter, remember, had denied Jesus three times. And, and three times Jesus asks him, do you love me? And yeah, there, you know, p scholars have noted, you know, there's a couple of different words for love. And by the way, there's also a couple of different words for feed and a couple of different words for sheep. Now, I think that's just John mixing it up a little bit. Uh, do you love me? Three times. Corresponding to three times where you denied me. And as we read that, I think we are supposed to identify with Peter because I think Jesus is asking the same question to us. Yes, do you believe me? But do you love me? And if you do, then do something about it. Trust me. Believe in me. And then go tell someone else.